So, so Sue, I got anyway, a question. I got a question for you. So, yeah, you know, your sure. lecture, your your one lecture here, you did many of them, but this one is on ptosis. So, this is a disease that was universally ignored <laughs> by people until very recently, right? That's right. Because they couldn't That's do right. anything, right? And you didn't want to offend anyone. But now, of course, you can right. offend everyone because you actually have a treatment right. for this. <laughs> yeah, so interesting because you know I just did the uh, lecture on this and we addressed the differential diagnosis and how do you measure it and what the surgeon and what the options were and I had to put on the chat that this lecture was drafted and given before Upneek was approved so a lot of I got some comments like has anybody tried Upneek so I tried to direct everybody to this little chat but yeah you're right I mean up until now I mean I've been guilty the habit has been to do a rather cursory look at the eyelids not paying much attention to the position or function unless there really was obvious asymmetry or the patient brought up concerns but you know, now knowing that we have alternatives to surgery, uh, it's important to look at the lid anatomy and function, you know, both qualitatively and quantitatively, you know, in a methodical fashion on a routine basis. So, um, Upneek gives us the advantage of, as you, you said, insulting people. We try not to do that. We, uh, <laughs> we have methods of uh, bringing that up uh, in a very politically correct fashion. Um, sometimes a patient will bring it up, but oftentimes, the way I will do it is, uh, you know, when I have them under the microscope and I'm explaining what I'm looking at and I go from one eye to the other, I'll say, gee, I'm measuring a little difference in the position of the eyelids. Is that something you've ever noticed? And that will be a springboard. If they say no, then I'll say, okay, that's great. It's not an issue. Um, just know that if it ever bothers you and I explain to them what the symptoms might be down the road, that we have a drop that can lift the lid. And then I leave it at that. Done. But if they say, gee, oh, my God, yeah, my eyelid, like if it's bilateral ptosis and they say my eyelids have always been heavy uh, or I feel like um, I'm just, I don't like the way I look in pictures. I mean, then it's easy to just say, great, we have this great option and, and I go, we go from there. We, right. uh, we do a little in-office uh, trial with Upneek and then we teach, we show them how they can get it. Right. Well, what I liked about your lecture, too, was you reviewed the anatomy and physiology of this condition, right, which is something I think everyone's forgotten. Um, and I know that yeah, some, people, I mean, I, some yeah. people are better candidates than others, right, based on what's actually going on. Yeah, sure. So it's for the approval is for acquired blepharoptosis, which, as you know, Adam, is more prevalent with age. As a matter of fact, the statistics show that about 11 percent of patients will acquire, you know, some form of blepharoptosis as we get older. Um, now, interestingly, being in a, and Paul will know this, um, Paul basically set up our entire demographic for Upneek because back then we were fitting hard, you know, he was fitting hard lenses and I still have many of those patients. And, you know, these patients literally come in, you know, lifting up their chins and looking down at their noses. Uh, some of them have significant bilateral ptosis due to the distance of the lid. Uh, from, you know, pulling on that lid in terms of uh, removing the contact. So for us, it's probably more than 11.5%. Um, but it can also happen with soft lenses. But yes, acquired blepharoptosis, the differential has to be made because, you know, there can be underlying serious systemic or, you know, isolated conditions. Um, you know, the isolated acquired blepharoptosis, such as trauma, surgery, I mean, that's obvious. The patient will basically walk in and tell you the story. Um, but if they walk in and it's neurogenic or myogenic, then you do have to be careful. Uh, the first thing I do is I look similar to pupillary, um, you know, differences in pupil size. Uh, you know, first thing I do is I have to look at a picture from way back or their, their driver's license. And if it is something new, then it has to be investigated further. Right. And so with the patients that come in, you actually, if you've determined them to be a candidate, you actually give them a trial right there in office? Yeah, so basically I do the exam, and if I'm going to, let's say, dilate them, I, I actually will put in the, the upneak first, wait a couple minutes, and then I'll put the dilating drop right in after. So while they're dilating, we're waiting for their pupils to open and their lid to lift. I take a picture. The company provides us with a tablet with an app. Uh, oftentimes I'll just use my cell phone or, right. or use their cell phone because what's nice is then they can just look at it, take it home, and show their friends and family. And we take a before and after. The onset of effect is about five minutes for most patients. At about 15 minutes, you've pretty much achieved maximum lift. And um, un everybody has to understand that this is an alpha adrenergic, and it works on Mueller's muscle. And we and as we know, Mueller's muscle is only responsible for one to two millimeters of lift anyway. 
So you can't expect more than that. But two, but there's there's a couple of studies that showed um, three and a half millimeters of lift on some patients. So that's an interesting one. But if you get two millimeters of lift, I mean that's significant uh, because most ptosis or noticeable or functional ptosis occurs at about uh, you know when the when the marginal reflex distance is about down to two millimeters or three millimeters. So um, yeah, it's very effective. And what's nice is there's no tachyphylaxis. So in other words, you can use it for weeks and weeks. The studies go out to six weeks and it shows the efficacy is still there. In terms of how the sustain, uh, how long this effect is sustained, um, we've looked at patients at, you know, six, eight hours and it is sustained through that. So it's a once a day drop. It is um, preservative free. And you know, it's, um, you know, a safe drop, very safe. You know, there may be some contraindications as you would have with any alpha adrenergic, which would be significant cardiovascular problems, but most patients do not fit into that category. Right. So I was going to ask, is it going to get an effect with phenylephrine 10% or it's the same pharmacological action with all the side effects that you uh, don't feel any benefit in combining them? Uh, no, I wouldn't use phenylephrine 10. I mean, I've never tried it, but just I would not clinically use phenylephrine 10%. Um, to me, that has far more side effects. You have to understand that this is a selective adrenergic blocker. So much the same way that you have selective beta blockers for glaucoma. Um, this is a selective. It's mostly a alpha adrenergic 2, more than 1. So what's nice is you do not get rebound hyperemia. And, in, in and you certainly don't get pupil dilation either, so that's nice. Right. And in terms of patient response, can they actually notice the difference straight away when when you do a trial with them? Their chins do they their chins come down finally, and they can <laughs> look straight oh, ahead yeah. again? So um, yeah, I mean, so those are the more severe ones. But absolutely, I mean, I have my whole cell phone now. Aside from pictures of my grandson, is basically my patients with. Uh, I have all my I have all my up and patients uh, on my phone, um, and yes, yeah, so. Um, you know, it's marked, and not every patient suffers from, you know, visual, they notice a visual field defect. It's only the more severe ones that will actually, you know, lift the chin. Most patients complain more about the cosmesis and just feeling more tired. And, you know, we're used to looking at dry eye, we're used to looking at binocular vision defects, but we have to keep in mind that ptosis can create the same complaints. Yep. I even wonder how many people in their in their EHR mark this off when they're seeing patients routinely now, right? Actually taking any measurements. Do people even do that? I think they will. I mean, we do. When we are prescribing a medication, we're always more careful to quantify on the record and certainly indicate it as a diagnosis. So I think if you're going to be prescribing it, um, yes, I, I would agree that people should start doing it if, if they haven't been, you know, previously. Excellent. And do you still sort of use things like crutches and so forth, or these <laughs> old school old school methods, or have you moved moved on? Yeah. So I mean, no, I don't use crutches. If a patient has that, you know, if if it's not a mule, if the levator is that de hip, uh, you know, Mueller's muscle ain't going to take up all the slack. So for that, I would did, you know refer out to oculoplastic. And nobody's saying that this is a substitute. Uh, for some patients, it may be. I mean, you know, if they have a mild ptosis or mild asymmetry, um, or for some reason can't undergo surgery, but most patients in the end, the more severe ones, will want, you know, an oculoplastic surgical, you know, remedy for this. So uh, it's, uh, it's a, you know, a, a way to kind of co-manage. Sure. And, you know, one, one question I had, too, is this all sort of came out around the time of the pandemic, right? Um, it's sort of, <laughs> there's like an overlap. And my question would be, is this generally available, like, out here in the, in the wilds of Oregon? Do pharmacists, can they get this product? Or, I mean, I guess in Manhattan, it's, oh, it's yeah. easy, right? So, oh, so this is a very unique, uh, how shall I put it, um, how, the, how they, how they um, provide it. So RBL, which is the company that developed the um formula they have their own pharmacy mm. so a couple of things everybody needs to be aware of um, one is that if you can only get it through rvl so you actually can put it through your your normal ehr or however you order your pharmaceuticals for patients through the computer and then the, the company will contact the patient to finalize the delivery they'll take their credit card number it is not covered by insurance so it's out of pocket 
Um, so anybody can get it anywhere in the country. Um, they are, it's a small company. They are trying to get reps out to the boonies, as you said. Uh, they, are, they are not yet in every state and every region, but they're trying. Um, you can email the company or email me if you wish. I'm happy to put you in contact with them, and they will get back to you and go over how to do this. They have, they have brochures that um, you give, well, not brochures, but you know, just a slip of paper that you give the patient as to the, how to get it and what's going to happen. Um, so it's very simple to do. And just as an aside, um, coming this Wednesday night and then for a few other nights, we're going to be going through all this, uh, me and a couple of the other um, uh, KOLs for Upneek. We're doing webinars, and I'm, I'm going to be pairing with Dr. John Feza, who has an amazing practice in Florida. So he and I are going to be doing two presentations Monday, uh, Wednesday night, and then there are a couple after. So just go on if you, you know, you can um, find the link and just sign up for one of our presentations and we're going to take everybody through all of this. Oh, very cool. I'm, I'm happy to plug it for you if you, could, if you could send the link or I could find it here. I'm on actually, oh, I'm, I'll do, yeah, because I'm on a, a yeah, big site sure. right now. Yeah, sure, Adam, I'll send, I'll send you the link uh, in the, yeah, I'll, send, I'll email it to you because um, I don't know how else to get it to you. It was sent out in email, then you can figure out how to transfer that. Sure. I'm really bad at that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm actually uh, browsing I'm their website right now, so you're absolutely right. So you have to go to the, their Uplifting Pharmacy Experience, right? So they have a website. Right. And the, the procedure that you go through to actually uh, get the, the drug to the patient. So that's pretty yeah. cool. They, they, you know, they make it so easy for you. Like, you do nothing. All you do is, like, uh, put it into the... the the EMR, the uh, not the EMR, the you know whatever pharmaceutical platform you use, and then they take it from there. But to answer your question, we do provide the patient with about a three-day sampling. And if you call the company, if you don't have a rep, they will send you samples. Uh, it's in individual tubes, and again, you use it once a day. You have to, you know, you have to tell the patient it's uh, it's always preservative-free, and it is. Um, you know, it's a very comfortable drop to use. I haven't had any stinging or burning or, you know, anything like that. Very cool. Excellent. Well, you know what? If you can get me that link, what I'll do is I'll take this little interview that we're doing and I'll clip it out and I'll put it on ODYR so people can just watch our little talk here. And I'll put the link right beneath it Great. because I know that you said it's coming up on Wednesday. So that I, it's mine and Dr. Feza and then I know Dr. Karpecki and a couple of uh, of the other, as you put it, classical speakers. I like that. Instead of saying old fart, a couple of the other. <laughs> thank you for that. A hey, couple listen. of the other class, class, classical speakers um, are on there. Um, we what what uh, what RBL did was so cool. So they paired ODMD up for each of the presentations, so we can really combine, talk about how we do this, compare notes. Uh, it's really it's a it's a nice way to. Bring um, bring the professions together. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Great. So I will send that to you shortly, Adam. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you for doing this, and again, thank you for being part of CE Wire again for the 85th time. <laughs> I'm glad it's over. <laughs> I mean, it's been fun, but you know, this year has, has been dragging on a little bit too long. Well, you guys are just doing an amazing job, and I was looking at the. Uh, attendance and i'm just so impressed that people are still logging on and forth and, it's uh, it's you know, surprising it's to me great. i don't know if, yeah i don't know if you heard we we got our six thousandth uh participant yesterday morning for this year wow do they get some sort of a prize or something? <laughs> that's actually a good idea <laughs> for sure um yeah. i think you should have had a drone deliver <laughs> like <balloons. laughs> send them some up and you're correct sue the amount of people in the rooms are just phenomenal. People are you know, getting their last, I guess some states have their biennial be the calendar year, so they need the credits desperately, as well as right. the great education you provide. Exactly. All right, so um, okay. enjoy, uh, you know, I'm gonna enjoy the rest of the meeting and you guys just get through it and uh, get some sleep. All right, well, thanks Sue, and we will catch up with you in, uh, in 2021, so after our, after our little Sounds vacation. Good. All right. Thanks. Happy holidays. Bye. Happy holidays. Catch you later. Hey, bye. 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 bye.